Good morning. My name is Cameron Clousing. I am a spirit is moving. Um, I am a lecturer here at Christ College, and uh, it's always an honor and a privilege to uh, come and preach at Grace Point uh, here at, at the Burwood campus. Um, the passage we're looking at today is either incredibly easy or incredibly difficult. I mean, after having read it, the question that, that I have often is, how do you add to this? The, the wonder and glory of heaven is revealed, and finally, Christ's declaration, it is finished, is shown to be completely finished. The, the Bible commentator G.K. Beale says that this is the hinge on which all of history runs. So as we come to this passage in Revelation chapter 5, let's pray that the Lord would open our eyes and with all of heaven stand in wonder of what God has done and what we have seen. Let, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we, we praise you this day that you have not left your church to wander aimlessly, but you have given us your word and your spirit. We, we praise you that your uh, son has, has given us many gifts. And so today, Lord, we come thankful for those gifts. We rest in the promise that you will speak to us through your word. We, we rest in the promise that your spirit will use this, your word, to conform us to the image of your son. So, Lord, we, we pray that you do this. Open our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, and our hands to respond. We pray all of this with hope and with expectation that we will one day be with Christ. We pray all of this in his name and in the power of his spirit who live and reign with you, one God, always and forever. Amen. The author C.S. Lewis, in his preface to the epic poem Paradise Lost, says this. He says, the first qualification for judging a piece of workmanship from a corkscrew to a cathedral is to know what it is. What, what it was intended to do and, and how it was meant to be used. After that has been discovered, the temperance reformer may decide that a corkscrew was made for a bad purpose. And the communist may think the same about the cathedral. But such questions come later. The first thing is to understand the object before you. As long as you think that the corkscrew was meant for opening tins, or the cathedral for entertaining tourists, you can say nothing to the purpose about them. Be before we can say anything about the purpose, uh, or anything about the, the passage in front of us today, we need to know what it is. And, and, and when we come to a book like the book of Revelation, one of the temptations is to be confused with what exactly this is. We can start to think that this is a book about many things. We can start to think that this is a book about ourselves. We, we can start to think that this is a book about the Antichrist or about the future or about end times events. However, if we start there, I, da I dare say that we miss the point of this book. And, and today's passage centers around that which, or, or perhaps better, the one who is the center of the book of Revelation, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the, the, the root of David, who is also the lamb who was slain. The creation of the world, the unfolding of history, the destiny of people and nations centers on who this God is. The whole universe is destined to be filled with the glory of God. His goodness will fill the earth. His praise will fill the universe. 
And the primary purpose of this book is to herald his good providence and his sovereign purposes. The only response to having seen the lamb who was slain is the response of those in heaven. We'll look at this passage that we have in front of us and see that it progresses in three steps. First, we will see the problem which brings weeping. Then we will see the solution which is brought by the worthy one. And finally, we'll see the response which is worship. In Revelation chapter 4 and 5, we are given two scenes. The two scenes from the same vision, but, but two scenes, and, and we're taken into the throne room of God, the, the throne room of heaven, and it's a single vision where, it, where we see the Lord appear, the, the king of all things in heaven and on earth, and the scene in chapter 4 gives us God's glory in his work of creation. And the heavenly hosts proclaim, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. And now in chapter 5, the, the scene shifts. God's, uh, it shifts to God's work of recreation, uh, of redemption. The, the camera lens, if you will, shifts from the one on the throne to a scroll. A scroll perfectly sealed with seven seals. And the Lord seated on the throne, the throne of judgment and rule, holds this scroll. What in the world is this scroll in his hand? The text helps us to understand. First, we should notice some clues almost immediately upon seeing this scroll the scroll is written on the back and on the front. It's crammed full of details. Nothing is missing. It's comprehensive. It is complete. However, at the same time of realizing that this is a scroll that is, that is crammed full of information, we should also recognize that the scroll reminds us of things that, that have been said before. Maybe not in the book of Revelation, but, but in other books of the Bible. This, this scroll that's written on the front and on the back should immediately trigger our minds to thinking of other times in prophetic literature where, where a scroll is talked about, where scrolls are, are present, where scrolls where, the, where there's writing on the front and the back are present. Our minds should be brought to Ezekiel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 12, Zechariah chapter 5, or, or Isaiah 29. However, more particularly than that, our, our minds should be brought to Exodus chapter 32, verse 15. I'm sure you all know this story. It's that story of, of Moses coming down from Mount Sinai. And what is he carrying as he comes down from Mount Sinai? Don't think of the movie, The Ten Commandments. He's, he is carrying the Ten Commandments, but what does it say? The text says that, that the commandments are written on the front and the back of these tablets of stone. You see, you see the, the, the image that we should have in our minds as we read about this scroll that has writing on the front and the back is that image of Moses coming down from Sinai with the Ten Commandments, and they are inscribed on the front and the back. And what, we're, what, what, what John is pointing us to in this vision, what, what he's seeing here in this scroll is indicative of the, of the fact that the fullness of God's revelation, the, the fullness of God's covenantal revelation, the fullness of God's relationship and his, and, his, and his dealing with humanity is contained in this one scroll that is in the right hand of the Lord, that, that, that's perfectly sealed. The, the second clue that we have in verse 1 is right there of, of what this scroll is. You see, this scroll is a sealed document. It's a legal statement. It has multiple seals. It is a very important document. It has seven seals. This indicates that, that, that this could be something from a, a will of inheritance or perhaps a, a covenantal blessing. Our mistake at this point would be to try to figure out exactly what, is, uh, what this is about from looking at the immediate context. 
Uh, that, that is to say, our mistake in, in trying to figure out what exactly is going on in this one verse would be to try to figure it out from just looking at the book of Revelation. However, that would be exceedingly odd because we, we know and we, we, when we're learning how to study the Bible, the first thing we're taught when, we're, when we learn to study the Bible is that the best commentary on Scripture is Scripture itself. And this is nowhere more true than when we come to a book like Revelation. You see here in, in, this, in this one verse, in, in the entire book, but, but particularly in this chapter, what we see in, in this book is, is cascading Old Testament images. It's image upon image upon image from the Old Testament coming to us. So what, what do we read in, in chapter 1, verse 6? Well, we read that the, that the church is a kingdom of priests. And that reminds us of Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, where, where we read that Israel is a kingdom of priests. And then when we continue to read in Revelation chapter 1, what we realize is that there's language of the tabernacle and of the temple, of a, of a great high priest. There's, there's thunder and lightning, and our mind should immediately go back to what happens in the book of Exodus. When Moses is on the mountain, he's, he's given the, the, the instructions for how to build the tabernacle. And, and as he's on the mountain, what's happening? There's thunder and lightning. You see, what, what John is pulling us to is the fact that there are images here, Old Testament images that, that remind us of and, and point us to what is on this scroll. Zechariah saw many of the same images that John sees and gives us here in, in Revelation. So, so what is on this scroll? In verse 1, what is on this scroll that, that's, that's shown to us in, in just this one verse? It seems that the, on this scroll, we have the scroll of the covenant that, that is to say, it's, it's, it's the book of the full inheritance. It's, it's the book that is, that is given to the one who is able to have victory over sin and death. The scroll, the scroll contains God's redemptive plan for all of history. It is the scroll of destiny, a scroll of judgment and salvation for the world. You see, what, what we have here in this one image of this scroll that is perfectly sealed with writing on the front and the back is the fact that there is a plan, that, that the Lord God Almighty has a plan and a purpose, a meaning and a direction for human life and existence, and it is held, it is sealed in the right hand of God Almighty. And the unsealing of this scroll implies that the work is finished and the plan of God has indeed from eternity past been at long last accomplished. But here's the problem. I mean, we've, we've just covered one verse. Here's the problem. And it's a problem that leads to weeping. Because you see, as we read verses 2 and 3, the tension ramps up and it causes John to cry. Because the question that's asked is, who will claim this inheritance? The angel with a strong voice asks, who is worthy? And there is silence in heaven. No one. No one in all of creation, no one in heaven, no one on earth, no one under the earth is worthy. And with that realization, John begins to weep. You see, John is yearning for the fullness of God's promises to be fulfilled. John is yearning for the fullness of God's redemption to finally be passed on, for the heir to be proclaimed, for the throne to be filled. So he weeps with longing. In his breaking down, John is in many ways portraying the anguish and distress of the human condition. We, we all feel that in, intuitively there is, there's a purpose to our being here. And yet on our own, we are incapable to, to discover that purpose. Often a sense of meaningless grips the human race. Shakespeare in Macbeth uh, indicates this when he says, life's but a, sh a walking shadow, a poor player. 
that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. See, John's tears are the tears of all of those, uh, all of us, who have sought to understand and penetrate the mystery of life and find only frustration. Much of of the artistic endeavors of our world, songs and poetry, are an attempt to find meaning in life. Some time ago, the, the columnist Bernard Levin wrote this. He says, to put it bluntly, have I time to discover why I was born before I die? I have not managed to answer that question yet, and however many years I have before me, they are certainly not as many as there are behind. There's an obvious danger in leaving it too late. Why do I have to know why I was born? Because, of course, I am unable to believe it was an accident. And if it wasn't one, it must have a meaning. See, John is asking the question, who can tell me what the meaning of life is? What's the point? Can anyone tell us? Can can anyone open this scroll? Can anyone unlock the meaning of human life? Has anyone found, has anyone, anyone been found to unlatch and reveal the purposes of God in history? Who is worthy? Who is worthy to open this scroll? And when the question of who is worthy is asked, all of creation is silent. And that silence is deafening. It's a silence that leads to weeping. Is all lost. However, as quickly as John starts to weep, The tension is broken and the good news is given to us almost immediately when an angel comes in verse 5 and says to him, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Who is this? Who is this that, that, that is worthy? It's, it's not an angel. We've already heard that it's nothing in created order that can open the, this scroll. No, it is the Messiah. It is it, 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 the, the one who can open the scroll is the fulfillment of, of the promise in Genesis chapter 49, where we hear that the God will rise, raise up from the tribe of Judah one who will be fierce and mighty and will triumph over every one of the enemies. That the, the throne of David will be filled for all time with somebody from the tribe of Judah. However, it's not just a lion from the tribe of Judah that has overcome. He is also the root of David. This is a reflection on on Isaiah chapter 6 and chapter 11, where, where we are reminded that from the house of David will come the Redeemer. However, the fascinating thing is that the language is inverted here. The lion who is from Judah is not just a branch from David or, or an offshoot. No, no, he is the root of David. This is not just a proclamation that this is one of David's descendants, but this is a proclamation of the precedence of Christ, as proclaimed in Zechariah chapter 3, that the Lord Jesus Christ himself even said, before Abraham, I am. Or as Peter at Pentecost says, David lies in a tomb, but the Lord Jesus, who is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, he remains alive because of his resurrection. Therefore, he is before David. This is, this is a lion who, who is also the root of David. But verse 6 continues this imagery even more. And this lion who is the root appears... As John is looking for this great conqueror, this lion, who is standing there? It is a lamb standing as if slain. See, John looks, and he's he's looking for this great conquering beast, the, the lion. And he sees not a lion, but a lamb. 
And in here we have all of the promises of God who, who comes to take away the sins, the, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. The one before Abraham, before David, the Alpha and the Omega, makes his appearance standing before the throne, standing before the throne as, as, as one who, who is perpetually standing before the throne. He, he's standing as the one who has made the final and perfect and, 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 and sufficient sacrifice. He is the high priest in the offering, and, 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 and he stands as a lamb who was slain. You see, the gospel is summed up here in, in, in three declarations. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's, he's the conqueror. He, he is the root of David. He, he, he is the one in whom David finds his fulfillment. But not only that, he, he conquers by being the lamb who was slain. The great Reformed theologian Vern Poitras says this, of this vision. He says, this vision sets forth in dramatic form the central paradox of the Christian faith. God achieved his triumph and delivered his people not through the fireworks of military might, but through the weakness of crucifixion. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians, this way of doing things is an offense to the worldly way of thinking. Paul in Corinthians puts it this way. He says, For the word of the cross is folly for those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. But, the, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. It, it is this incredible paradox, it, it's this beautiful picture, this seeing of the one who is worthy, which turns our weeping into worship. All of heaven sings in seeing the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the lamb who was slain. It, it, all of heaven bursts into rejoicing. However, there's one more thing to notice from this strange picture. A, a lion who is a lamb is, is not... <laughs> is not the only odd thing to notice here, but it's, 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 it's a lamb, a, a beast of weakness, a, a beast of innocence, a, a beast of sacrifice, a, a slain lamb, a, a lamb not lying on the butcher's slab, not, not on the altar of sacrifice. He, he is bloodied, but he is not bowed. He is standing proud. This one who who permanently stands before the throne, is described as having seven horns. What are these seven horns symbolizing? They, they, they remind us of Old Testament passages once again. Old Testament allusions to power in Deuteronomy chapter 33, or, or 1 Kings 22, or Psalm 89, or Daniel 7. The, these seven horns represent the, the fullness of strength and power. The slain land conquers. Christ's death, the end time sacrifice of the Lamb, not only redeems but conquers. The lion triumphs first by being a slain lamb. But not only are there seven horns, but there are also seven eyes. Immediately we're told that, that these seven horns and eyes are the seven spirits of God. The language being pulled here is, once again, from Zechariah chapters 3 and 4. And this is the outflowing of the seven manifestations of the Holy Spirit. This, this lamb who is standing by the throne of his father is empowered to be all-knowing and all-powerful. The, the wounds of his warfare, the scars of his sacrifice, be, uh, become the victory, uh, because of the victory of the lamb, emerges out of the suffering of the lamb. This is the one who is 
worthy to open the seals. This is the glory of God's redemption. A lamb who was slain is all-powerful and all-knowing. This is the paradox of, of the Christian faith. This is, this is the glory of God's redemption. A lamb who was slain had, knows all and has all power. The Scottish pastor and theologian of a bygone era, Thomas Chalmers, in his reflection on this passage says this, the chiefest concern in this passage is that the lamb of God, not spoken of before, is now represented as placed in the very same situation and surrounded by the very same objects and worshiped by the very same degree, to the very same degree by the hosts of heaven as the Lord God Almighty. What a mysterious union and incorporation and identity is here. The, there, God, the Father, is on the throne and he sat. Here, Christ is in the midst of the throne and he stood. There, the Spirit of God is before the throne and burned. Let us view the holy and humble, with holy and humble reverence this triune representation of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. What picture of glory this is. Jesus takes the, the scroll, this, this lamb who is slain, takes the scroll as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the, the, the lamb that was slain. He, he takes the scroll and, and, and the fulfillment of the vision from Daniel 7, the promise from Hebrews that he would come bearing not the, the blood of goats and bulls, but his own blood is fulfilled. And, and this vision shows us that the, that the very center of God's purpose is this lamb, a, a crucified savior. Everything centers on the lamb that was slain. At all of this, verses 8 to 17 tell us that there's a great worship which ensues. There are bowls which are the prayers of the saints presented what do we see here? Well, we see that the real power in the universe, the real power in this world is not in parliament, it's not in multinational corporations, but the real power is the hidden prayers, the prayer meetings of the church. The Lord uses these to direct history. The, 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 they sing a new song there's all, the, the singing of a new song is always the heralding of the great covenant promises of God. We, we see this in Psalm 33 or, or Psalm 40 or Psalm 96 or Psalm 98 or Psalm 144 or Psalm 149. They celebrate together in this glorious array the fullness of the promises that God is the Almighty One. And notice what they, what they celebrate. They, they don't celebrate Christ's nature as the eternal Son of God. They, they, they don't celebrate His work in creation. They celebrate what He has accomplished in history as the Lamb of God. They celebrate His, his work and His activity. What qualifies Him to open the seals? His work on the cross. They, they, they celebrate what he has done. He was slain. What is he, what, what he, is, uh, what he was, uh, what he is doing. You have made them a, a kingdom of priests to our God. And what he will do in the future, they shall reign on earth. This praise is all encompassing. It is all fulfilling. The blood of the lamb shed on the cross is a must at the very heart of God. His death was necessary that God could forgive us our sins because without that blood shed to ransom the church and turn aside the wrath of the holy God, we would have remained lost forever in sin and rebellion. And God's purpose and plan would have remained unfulfilled. It is, it is because of the cross, the slain lamb, that the seals of the scroll can be opened and men and women can be purchased for God. And here is where the mystery, the, the mystery of life and the heartache of human experience are answered. And people look everywhere for the answer to the mystery of life. I was reading a survey the other day that, that asked, that, that, that said of the top 10 questions that people are asking these days, and, and, and what is the meaning of life is number one. 
Number two, is there a God? And, and here's the answer to the, to, the, to the mystery of life. People look everywhere for this, and, and, we, and we can find the answer here. It is in the broken body and the shed blood of the Lamb. The only response that the people have, that the people of God can have, is to fall on their face and worship. And so they sing. This is what God is doing here and now. This is what God is doing in his world through the blood of his son. He is bringing people into his church. He's bringing people to know him and, and the purpose of life. What is God doing here in Sydney? What is God doing at Grace Point? He is ransoming people through his son. The church, what what we do here as we gather for worship, stands at the very heart of human history. It's It's only when all the ransomed are brought into the church that the curtain of history will fall and Christ will return We are only here because the church is not yet complete. And worship on earth is not as it is in heaven. It's not yet experienced in that same way. Yet, when we come here, we get a taste of that. You see, the church is is on the periphery of the world's plans, but it's not on the periphery of God's plan. It is at the very center of it. The the worship of God's people is not peripheral, but it is central. And this vision reveals that the the unique position of that worship and the unique position of Jesus. He he is not with the elders. He is not uh, with the angels. But he is on the throne and he is receiving praise and adoration. We we read, then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the voice of of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. The, the, the new song of praise is centered upon the lamb. The lamb alone is worthy of praise. And in this verse, the, the, the that in the, in the verse that follows, we see that this praise is amplified as the whole of creation joins in because it cannot restrain itself. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. This praise is offered to Jesus, the lamb upon the throne. The the glory is his. This is the Jesus that we worship here today. This is the worship of heaven. This is what we participate in when we gather as God's people. Yes, the world may have many bizarre and strange theories about who Jesus is and what he came to do, but here is the only Jesus that heaven praises. He is the conquering king, the mighty ruler, the enthroned lamb of God. Revelation 5, in Revelation 5, we see what was finished by Christ on the cross. Now, he uh, has now been delivered into his hands. The, The seals are his, the inheritance is his. In Revelation chapter 5, we see the promise made so long ago to Abraham that people from every tribe and every nation and every people, God would call to himself a remnant. We see the fullness of the covenant. The whole cascading work of of covenant theology is summed up in these few sentences. It is here that the revelation of the triune God and and the worship that is due to our sovereign God is proclaimed. In 1984, the apologist and missionary Francis Schaeffer wrote his final book as he was dying of cancer. The, the name of the book was The Great Evangelical Disaster. He says this, the ignorance of the church is more dangerous for a culture than the decadence of the world. 
What did Schaefer mean? He didn't mean our ignorance of public policy or of history. He didn't mean our ignorance of the affairs of our neighbors. No, what he is pointing to is the profound ignorance of the greatness and majesty and glory of God and of the Lamb who was slain. He is pointing to our seeming inability to act and to live, to have our, our being as if the gospel is true. Human life is is no longer a life of weeping when we gaze on the one who is worthy, the lamb who is slain. And this leads to our ultimate purpose in life, to worship him. And it's here on the Lord's day as we gather that we get to taste and see that the Lord is good. It's here on the Lord's day as we gather that we get to taste that ultimate purpose of life. Here in Revelation chapter 5, all of heaven and earth declare, the glo- uh, declare that the gospel is true. And that makes all the difference in the world. It, it changes everything. Thanks be to God that his work is done. And he calls us to sing the new song of redemption to the world that all might know him. This is the word of God for the people of God. But Him who has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit says to His church. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do come before You thankful for the work of Your Son on our behalf. We we thank You for the fact that You have ransomed for Yourself a people from every tongue and tribe and nation. We thank You, Lord, that the Lamb who is slain is the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David. We praise you, Lord, now that your son's work is finished and he is the one who is worthy to open the scroll, to to put on display for us the mysteries, the, the answers to the mysteries of life. Lord, cause us to live as if that is true. Cause us to adore your son. We pray this in the precious name of, of your son, our Lord and Savior. Amen.